If your company has a compliance program, then your company needs compliance training. If you want your program to be a success, that training needs to be the best. Join Sean Rogers and Tom Fox on Excellence in Training and learn just how good compliance training can be. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back again with Sean Rogers for another episode. Today, we're going to talk about establishing your program design objectives. So, Sean, what are program design objectives in your opinion? Well, in the previous podcast, Tom, we talked about the guiding principles um, that we wanted to put as our kind of the values for the program. Once you've established those, you're now ready to kind of get a little bit more into the weeds with what you want to accomplish and what characteristics um, you want the program to to have. Um, And so when I say characteristics, I'm talking about um, the usability and the applicability of the program and how you're going to match that to the needs of your company. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like when you go to the auto dealer. Um, you don't go there just in, with an idea that you want to buy a vehicle. You go there with some things in mind that you want. You might want four-wheel drive if you're in Michigan, or you may want um, a sedan because you want to get gas mileage. You're going to use it just to commute, or you may want an SUV because you're going to go off-road with it. You may want any number of things. So these are the design characteristics that you think about for your vehicle. A similar activity needs to take place when you're thinking about um, designing your compliance training program. Um, and, you know, at GM, when we looked at this, we came up with a series of, of several design objectives um, based upon feedback we'd received from prior year's comments and also from the executive team about what they wanted the training to look and feel like and how they wanted it to function. Sean, with that, uh, what are... Uh, some of the design objectives you and your team came up with or at least felt were important for a training program? You know, I I probably don't need to go through all 10, but I'll pick the best ones. Um, We wanted to, first of all, make sure that it was really applicable. Now, this goes back to the guidance you received where a training program should be tailored and risk-based. We wanted to make sure that the program was aligned to our risks. And, you know, if you know the history of GM, you know we've had um, risk or situations that weren't really related to what I would call the traditional compliance risks like FCPA or trade violations. Of course, we're concerned about those. Um, but we've had issues um, with speaking up and bringing issues to the forefront and making sure they're directly addressed. We've had issues with, with some safety concerns. Um, we're always doing recalls and trying to make sure that our vehicles are as safe as they possibly can be. So we wanted to make sure that the training program was aligned to the big picture of GM's risks and not just a narrow um, set of courses. Um, you know, and the other thing that we found that found was very important is that we wanted the courses to have a professional design um, a good look and feel. We wanted them to reflect the culture of GM by using pictures of our employees and our vehicles. Um, we wanted to make sure it followed the branding guidelines so that it looked like, even though we're using an outside vendor, that it looked like a GM product. When you do that, it sends a message that the company is really invested in this. Um, and we also use leader videos, especially from, from Mary um, when she speaks to us. So we wanted to have it really aligned and really professional. Um, Then we wanted to make sure it was engaging. You know, um, sometimes, and I'm not saying this happened at GM, it's other places I've been that I've seen this, sometimes the training can look like just a voiced over PowerPoint slide with stock photographs, you know, and maybe that's good enough for some smaller enterprises, but for a Fortune 500 company, we felt that this really should be something that we um, made it engaging and really invested in it. Um, you know, and I think another one that we need to watch out for is we want to make sure we speak the language of the business and make this non-legalistic. Um, you know, it's so easy in a compliance function that's usually being run by lawyers or staffed by lawyers to fall into the trap of speaking like lawyers. And there's always going to be an element of that, right? There's always, when you're talking about anti-bribery, anti-corruption or trade, there's always going to be an element of that. But you want to make sure you speak the language of the business. So one of our design objectives was to make sure that the program spoke in the terms of engineers and marketing folks and and your IT folks. It spoke it spoke in a language that was easily understandable and and not um, the language of of the of the law per se. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to make sure that our our program was flexible. 
you just never know when there's going to be a risk come in from left field that you just weren't expecting something, something weird. And, and, you know, we don't want you to, we don't want in our training program to lock us in that we're going to do this course in 2022 and we can't do anything other than marching to that. We want to make sure that if something comes up, we have um, a structure in place that we can be flexible. So those are a few of the things. Um, you know, one, one thing that was so small that, that really irritated our learners, we found, was that between courses, they had to learn a new menu structure, and they had to go to a different place for their resources, and the knowledge checks were not consistent. Sometimes there were multiple choice, and sometimes there were multiple answer or single answer, and, um, and just, so just doing something as simple as standardizing the interface. Um, those are, those are kind of the kind of things we looked at in, uh, in the actual design. And so we, we put together a set of standards and said, you know what, if you're going to play in this space of corporate required training, um, we want to make sure that you follow these guidelines. Almost became a style guide. Sean, uh, as I was listening to you, it really struck me that this is either, uh, at least in, as I envisioned it in my head, uh, sort of a a straight line, a, a long, perhaps uh, somewhat bending river, uh, but a flow literally starting from, we have certain legal requirements under the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program. But from there, you really started with uh, what are our risks? Who are the people in our company that have, or at least are exposed to those highest risks? What sort of information do they need that they can manage those risks? How can I communicate or how can we communicate to them a risk management strategy? How can they retain that risk management strategy? And as important as anything else, if a new risk comes up or a risk morphs, how can we deliver to them the information so that they can manage a new, different, or uh, morphed risk? And it's, it's almost a Perhaps now I'm thinking a, a continuous cycle, but I'm, I'm really seeing every part interconnected. Would that be a fair assessment? You know, you, you're, you're heading up to another podcast that I want to do, but I'll, I'll give you a preview. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> we, we, as we designed this, we realized that we had what we call the training continuum or the training maturity continuum. But at the base level, there are certain things that are just so important that you have to reinforce them pretty much every year. And I'm talking about the basic building blocks. You know, we have a hotline. We, you're, it's important to speak up. We don't retaliate. You know, we have conflicts of interest. Um, we have a code of conduct. And it's important for you to review it. Those kinds of things, what we call at the foundational level. But then as you move up the spectrum, the next level, and we still do online for the second level as well, that's when you come into the really the risk-focused instruction. And it's that second level where we have the adaptive courses that match the user's risk profile. Somebody might get 10 minutes of content on anti-corruption, or depending on where they're located, they may get 40 minutes of training on anti-corruption. And then, then once you go past that, you even get into a, another level of training that requires you to put your best people um, in front of the people that are exposed to the risk. And so you move into a live training model um, where you're actually getting out there and talking to them face to face and having a training session and a consultancy session with them. And then you even move to one level higher. And that's when you go to your gatekeepers, the people that are responsible to being the watch, the watch, um, watchman on the tower looking out for these risks. And so these are the extension of your compliance function. And you've got to train them too. You've got to train them about what they need to look out for and what the red flags are and when they need to engage someone from legal or compliance. And so we, we certainly do want to make sure that we're not just repeating the same things every year, but that we're going up that maturity continuum and we're addressing the full spectrum of risk at the level um, where the employee is faced with those risks. So you're, you're preaching my, your, my, my tune. You're, you're singing my tune, Tom. Excellent, John. Well, this has just been a fascinating explanation, exploration, rather, and I greatly look forward to seeing uh, what we come up uh, with for the next episode. Sean, thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity, Tom. Always great to talk with you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Excellence in Training. Help get the word out by rating us and leaving a review.